All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started here. We definitely have a full house uh, trying for folks. Thanks if you're on the phone. Thanks for joining us as well. And uh, for the, those folks that are, you know, unable or missed parts of this, we will try to get a recording to you after the workshop is over. Um, with that, if we can go on to the next slide. Great. So today, um, I'm Natalia Abrams. I'm the executive director here at Student Debt Crisis. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to fundamentally reforming the way we pay for student debt um, and or pay for higher education and thus eliminating student debt here uh, in America. And we really uh, try to work with you all as much as we can to help you get your minimum payments or monthly student debt payments under control because we know that it's truly a crisis here in our country. And today we're really honored to be joined by uh, some folks on the student debt team. We have Cody Hunanian, but then also our special guests and partners at Savvy. We have Lindsay Clark. Lindsay, are you on the line? Hi, Natalia. Yes, I am. Thanks so much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Clark, and I'm Director of External Affairs at, at Savvy and a student loan borrower myself. Um, just a quick bit about Savvy. We are a social impact tech startup based in Washington, D.C., and founded by student loan advocates and policy experts to help borrowers like yourselves navigate the complicated and repayment forgiveness process. Um, so I'm excited to be here today to talk about, you know, a free tool we've developed to help borrowers in need um, and looking forward to being able to help answer any of your student loan questions. So thanks, Natalia. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, and as I said, Cody, and we have other folks being monitored the chat. So with that, we can move on to the next slide. Great, so we just wanted to let you know today's workshop is part of a new uh, student loan borrower outreach program that we just launched. And we want to make sure that we're reaching as many borrowers as possible especially many of you that we've heard from that have lost your job due to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and don't worry, even if you had lost your job before that, that, many of these programs will still apply to you. So we're gonna teach you um, basic student loan based, uh, repayment information about your options and the and student loan forgiveness programs. And at the end, we'll. We're really excited to share this free tool that will help you understand all of your options. So everything we go over today will feel like a lot. We know that. And so there is a program that you can use at the end to enroll for free. Um, there's nothing that will ever take you to a paid uh, situation coming from student debt crisis and will help you understand these repayment programs. Moving on. And everything we talk about today, uh, this video after the workshop is over, the tool that we talk about and additional resources is available um, at, and for the folks on the call, it's a little bit of a strange website, but it's bit.ly backslash borrower resources. And that's where you can go to find out all of the information that you're going to hear about today. Great, so we just want to talk about, you know, we hear so much from supporters and um, all student loan borrowers that talk to us and we know that this is, you know, not, this is just a crisis for everyone, whether you're we're here in California we, or, or New York or DC or Texas, we are all really dealing with this. And unfortunately, we are seeing that this is, this is really becoming a civil rights issue and impacting Black borrowers and Latinx borrowers and borrowers of color more so um, than white counterparts, but we are all impacted by this. And we see that, you know, half of black borrowers are behind on their loans. Two thirds of all student debt is owed by women. That's more than a trillion dollars owed by women alone. And as you can see from these other points, this is a really big issue. So we wanna fight, you know, for all people that are dealing with the student loan crisis. Yes, and I saw in the chat, and absolutely older adults too, and parents, uh, a, lot, a lot of this information will also apply to parent loans, um, and we'll go over that a little bit more in the future. So, moving on.
Great. So moving on with kind of this impact and why so many folks are in crisis is that we are seeing, you know, this domino effect of a negative impact on being able to build any type of wealth. Um, so many of us that have student loan debt are unable to purchase a car, unable to purchase a home, um, and frankly are drowning with the student debt that we have. And we see that, you know, so many borrowers, you know, Latinx borrowers here in California, especially more of the time, are more prone to unemployment and um, especially during times like this. And that's one of the biggest reasons we want to bring this to you today is we know that a lot is going on. Many borrowers are being impacted by COVID-19, by unemployment issues, um, and want to know what the new updates are concerning student loan debt. Moving on. Great, and so with that, we're gonna start with the basics, give you some re quick resources, go over notes. This is really a great section to learn how to find your loan, but unfortunately a lot of folks, when you just start to pay it back, aren't, are unable to find uh, their loans. Moving on. Great, so with uh, loans, many of you have probably a mix of these. We have federal loans or loans that are from a government, or maybe if you're like myself with older loans, you have loans that are from a government, but also from a bank. Like I said, this can be a lot and become confusing. Then many uh, student loan borrowers also need private loans as well. We have a chart for those on the phone, I'll explain basically federal loans are going to be need-based, subsidized, or unsubsidized. The big difference between federal loans and private loans is that with federal loans, there are repayment programs. There are, there are options if you fall into de default, or def um, and there are def public service loan forgiveness programs. With private loans, there's, there are none of those type of programs. However, you can at times speak one-on-one -on -one with your lender. Moving forward. So this is just to give you a picture of who you may be paying your loans to. We call your loan collection company a federal loan servicer. So you may have heard of terms like Navient or Great Lakes or Nelnet. These are gonna be your federal loan servicers. Not to get confused though, Navient will also hold some of your private loans as well. Just like Sally Mae or SoFi or Discover or your bank like a Wells Fargo. You, where it are places you could have received a private loan from. Moving on. And what should these, quote, servicers be doing for you? I say, quote, for servicers, because many times when we speak to our supporters, they don't feel like they've gotten much service or much help when they call to ask, how do they make a lower payment? How do they restructure their payments? So what they should be doing is applying your student loan payments and processing them. And they should be enrolling and telling you about income-driven repayment plans, the best programs for you. They also should tell you about possible short-term deferment, and they should tell you about the loan forgiveness program. And they should be keeping you up to date. Hopefully, most of you have heard or received notices from your loan servicer for federal loans that you are, have, are not paying due to CARES Act, you should be receiving updates. And if you aren't, please let us know. Moving forward. Great, so there's, this is important for the most generous programs down the line. Um, so most loans uh, that are going to be applicable for the most generous repayment programs are direct federal loans. If you have loans past 2010, no problem. 99% of the time, you're gonna have direct loans. However, a lot of us took out loans before 2010, and the majority of us have what are called federal family education loans. Those FFEL loans on their own don't count for things like public service loan forgiveness. However, if you did consolidate, which may have happened between 2010 and now, you may also still be in the right direct consolidated loan. Then you see they're in the middle in orange, Perkins loans, those are loans that are given to you by your school. However, you, those also can be consolidated into one single loan. Moving on. So this is a quick 
uh, thing on how to find your loan. First, uh, you know, one place to go to find all of the information is studentaid.gov. Uh, if you don't remember your FAFSA pin from, you know, when you applied for college, like I don't, you could always create a new account and log in. And this will give you all of the federal information that your student loan servicer is seeing. Then we also recommend, and I'm already seeing a lot of folks in the chat ask about the website, um, where you can go to learn more about this special tool that we're going to tell you at the end of this workshop, and that's borrowers.bysavi.com. So for folks that, you know, this is all sounding like a lot, I highly recommend, you know, skipping one, two, three, and going right to uh, borrowers.bysavvy.com. And like I said, we will continue through this workshop to make sure to explain that all to you so for any folks that have questions. Moving on. So what if nothing's on that studentaid.gov site? Then 99% of the time, you probably have private loans. A great, to find your private loans, there's gonna be no info at studentaid.gov. It's probably something where you may have had a co-signer Different than a Parrot Plus loan, but an actual cosigner on your loan from a bank. Um, it will show another place to check is your credit report. And I think, which is obvious to a lot of us, contact the lender, servicer, or debt collector you're speaking with, and they should tell you who they are and the type of loan that you, you have with them. Moving forward. So now we're going to go over what has been going on. Um, Gosh, I think it's been five, seven months for, for some of us, depending on what state you're in, with COVID and how that pertains to student loan borrowers and your student loans. Moving forward. So we saw <clears throat> the CARES Act pass through both houses, both the Senate and the House. And the CARES Act suspended payments uh, for most federal student loan borrowers, we know that there are many of you that did not match. Um, most federal student loan borrowers, it will waive payments and the interest, so interest is at 0% until September 30th. That, that, when I say most loans, we do, the, it is excluded 9 million commercially held SSEL loans. Those are the federal family education loans. And now to no fault of your own, you may have had a commercially held cell loan and you may have had a non-commercially held one. We know many folks that have both. So some folks, some of their loans may have been covered, but not all of their loans. Um, Perkins loans as well as private loans were also left out of the CARES Act uh, laws that were passed. All of these suspensions, time counts towards public service loan forgiveness and rehabilitation programs. It also counts towards income-based repayment. Um, suspended payments are treated as, as on-time payments for credit reports. Moving forward. So in addition, um, this halts involuntary collections uh, for certain for the federal loan borrowers for six months, including you should not be having your wage garnished and you should not have your social security uh, withholding. Uh, you should also not be receiving collection calls uh, until at least September 30th. And uh, those, uh, we know that we have some students and some parents on this call, students that have been forced to withdraw from their last semester, um, can cancel your direct loan for that period of time that you've had to withdraw from due to COVID, to be clear on that. Moving forward. So now we understand that this is confu confusing for folks. So that was what was passed early on uh, with the CARES Act. Then we just saw, I believe it was in the last month that we received executive action. So to make it clear, because I know there was a couple of dates going on, now for federal loan borrowers, the majority of federal loan borrowers that do not have a commercially held fell loan or a Perkins loan, all of you, your payments right now are suspended until December 31st, and you're paying 0% interest. That means payments will resume on January 1st. That is for the majority of federal loan borrowers. So I just know that there's a lot of confusion with different dates. So we just wanna be really careful to you know that you're not gonna to have to 
pay your loan if you're one of those borrowers. In addition, it will also count time as long as you're in a qualifying job for public service loan forgiveness. It will count time for your loan rehab programs and income driven repayment and uh, continue all of the other things that I had mentioned on the previous slide of debt collection as well. Moving forward. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Cody Hunanian with Student Debt Crisis. Hey, thank you so much, Natalia, for that. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. Looks like we've got a packed house here. There's over 500 people attending today's workshop. Um, and I see, I think about 400 on YouTube joining the live stream. That's just incredible. Uh, so, you know, we're going to first cover uh, the federal loan repayment options that we kind of identify as the standard options. These are the choices student loan borrowers have when they first uh, enter repayment. But we know that a lot of people on the call today are joining us because these options are not sufficient enough and many people are struggling to afford their monthly payments. So my section after this is going to cover our affordable repayment options as well. So uh, Dylan, if we could go to the next slide. When borrowers enter repayment, this is six months after they leave school or graduate, they are put into what is called the 10-year standard repayment plan. And that means that you have fixed monthly payments and they will be the same amount every month for 10 years. And at the end of that time, your student loans uh, will be fully paid. Um, obviously, that is the intention of the student loan program, but many of us, again, uh, are struggling to afford our monthly payments and completely paying off our loans in 10 years is a tall ask. So on this next slide, there are some alternative options that do exist that can make your payments more affordable. Uh, we put these in the standard payment option because I'm going to show you some very powerful programs in just a second. But these alternative options include what we call extended repayment. So a borrower can extend from 10 years to many more years. So their monthly payment each month is less. You know, obviously like any loan product that can mean that you have more interest that's added to your loan. Uh, there's another option called graduated repayment. This is a situation where a borrower starts off with lower monthly payments. And then as they progress through their through the years, their payments increase um, over, over several steps. Uh, this can be helpful for some borrowers, but it also can set up a situation where a borrower starts off at an affordable repayment level, and then in several years from now, their monthly payments are much higher and they may not be able to afford it. And then there is the extended graduated repayment plan. The, this is just a combination of the two, where you can get a graduated payment schedule and you can extend the lifetime of the uh, loan repayment time. These are all options that exist. Some borrowers choose to enroll in them, but they're not quite as helpful as some of the programs I'm gonna discuss in just a moment. So we just wanna get those out of the way. Now on the next slide, I want to address the options that exist for borrowers who are in temporary hardship. So these are gonna be people who um, are maybe facing a short period of furlough, uh, maybe they're injured and they can't uh, attend work. Um, these are emergency options is how we like to frame them. So you've got deferment and you have forbearance. These are both a temporary pause or a temporary lower of your monthly payments. In the deferment option, if you have a federal subsidized loan, you won't have any interest accrued during your deferment period. For forbearance, interest does accrue. So borrowers who are enrolled in a forbearance, uh, they may pause or lower their monthly payments, but they'll see that their interest is starting to pile up. Again, these are options that we want to get out of the way early because for some borrowers, these are the only options told to them to make their monthly payments more affordable. But again, these are not necessarily the most effective or powerful options that are available. So these do exist. We want to check that off but I'm gonna get into something a little more interesting in just a moment. Now on the next slide here, uh, we want to address what happens for student loans who are in default. Now, if you're in student loan default, you do have the option to uh, return to good standing through a repayment program. Uh, what is default, you may ask? Here's a simple chart. If you're one day past due on your federal student loans, you're what we would call delinquent. 
that means that you're behind on your student loans, but you haven't had any permanent consequences uh, quite yet. Once you hit 90 days past due, you're now seriously delinquent and you'll have uh, negative credit reporting. That's when the permanent issues that can be problematic for borrowers begin. And then after that, 270 days, that's nine months past due, you are now in student loan default. And student loan default can come with a huge variety of consequences. It can include uh, huge fees. It can include not being able to access financial aid to complete your uh, educational program. It can mean uh, not being able to apply for certain jobs. So in the world of student loan debt, student loan default is one of the most consequential and scary things that we talk about. And that's why we really emphasize educating people about their programs so that they can avoid falling into default. So if we go to the next slide, uh, there is a repayment option for people who are in student loan default. Uh, we call it loan rehabilitation. So student loans that are in uh, default can agree with their debt collector uh, to make what we call nine excuse me, what we call a reasonable and affordable payments. And this can be as low as $5 per month. And if a borrower can make those payments nine out of 10 months, they may be able to return their loan to good standing. And then from there, now all of a sudden they're uh, accessible again for financial aid. Some of the fees can be reduced uh, and borrowers can um, frankly have this negative report uh, wiped clean. The problem is for many borrowers, uh, you can only complete this program once. So if you've completed the default rehabilitation program and you fall into student loan default again, you won't have an option to get out of it. Um, and so this is why the affordable repayment options we're about to discuss in a moment are important, not only to people who want to right now make their monthly payments more affordable, but also important to people who are way behind on their student loans and wanna get back on track and don't wanna fall behind again. Uh, Dylan, if we can go to the next slide here. Now, lastly, before we get into some of the income-driven uh, affordable repayment programs, uh, I wanna just check off another topic that comes up often during the workshops, and that's loan consolidation. And that is another option for student loan borrowers. Uh, a loan consolidation combines multiple loans into a new federal student loan, or you can take a single loan and create a new consolidated federal loan uh, to access programs that your specific loan type may not qualify for. Uh, now, consolidating into the newest type of loan, the direct loan program, also can only be completed once. And frankly, there are um, a set of consequences that are associated with consolidation, including having your accrued interest capitalized, meaning it's added to your principal balance. So we always encourage borrowers to think wisely before they consider uh, a federal loan consolidation. It can be more convenient, but it can create uh, unintended consequences and it can actually increase your total loan balance. And next slide, please. Great, so now that we got all that out of the way, those are your standard options. These, those were programs that any student loan borrower is eligible for. They exist, we want you all to be aware of them because uh, when you call your student loan servicing company, they're often gonna offer you uh, an extended or graduated repayment plan. They may offer you a deferment or a forbearance, but those are not necessarily the best choices for somebody who's facing long-term difficulty affording their monthly payments. You know, maybe you're working in an a underpaid uh, social worker position and you're not gonna afford your monthly payments anytime soon, but you wanna stay in this career. Uh, or maybe your, your job's been um, erased from the economy due to the COVID-19 crisis and you're facing a long bout of unemployment. Uh, that's where income-driven repayment plans start to come in again. Um, now, an income-driven repayment plan uh, is available to all federal student loans. Uh, you know, this is not something for private student loans. I see some folks in the uh, question box asking about that. So if you have a federal student loan and you're having difficulty affording your payments, this section's really for you. So let's go to the next slide here. So what is an income-driven repayment plan? Uh, income-driven repayment can make your monthly payments more affordable, and it does that through a calculation that's been set up, um, and you can find this calculation at the Department of Education's website at studentaid.gov. 
but what uh, is used is a percentage of your discretionary income. Uh, so it's based on your income and your family size, not your loan amount or um, you know, a traditional way of basing your monthly payments. It's about your family size and your income. So let's go to the next slide. Now the problem for some borrowers with, when it comes to income driven repayment plans is that there are so many of them and it can be very confusing. Uh, so here is just a quick chart of the programs. Starting on top, revised pay as you earn, that is the newest program. And at the bottom, income, income Contingent Repayment, ICR, is the oldest program. The government's added programs over the years, and you can see that um, they've become more generous over time. So the newest programs base your monthly payment on 10% of your discretionary income, and the max timeline for completing this program is 20 or 25 years. Um, now, in the older program, Income Contingent Repayment, that used to be 20% of your discretionary income, so it's twice as much, and the timeline was 25 years instead of 20. Um, now, what we mean by max timeline is that a borrower can re-enroll in one of these programs every year that they need it. And if you remain in an income-driven repayment plan for 20 or 25 years, depending on the program, whatever amount of student debt is remaining is uh, forgiven. Uh, it's taxed that year, so there are other implications to consider. But for borrowers who are, are in these programs, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It doesn't mean you're stuck in an income during repayment plan, paying back student loans forever and never seeing them uh, reduced. So let's go to the next slide here. It's a quick example, just to show you how powerful these programs are. Um, so let's consider someone who's a single borrower with one child, a single mother maybe, um, and they've got the average amount of student debt when a borrower leaves uh, college today, which is about $37,000. So you can see at uh, their 10 year standard payment, that's the normal monthly payment that you enter when you leave your program, their monthly payment would be $364 per month. Now, if that borrower is unemployed, making $0, their monthly payment can be as little as $0 per month. Even if a borrower is making $25,000 in income each year, their monthly payment can be reduced to $49 per month. Uh, and if a borrower is making $50,000 in income, there's still a significant savings if a borrower is struggling to afford their monthly payment. Now these numbers uh, you can find out for yourself if you go to studentaid.gov, that's the Department of Education's website, and they have a tool called the Loan Simulator. And that can give you some information about what your monthly payments would look like in these programs. Uh, you know, right before I got on the workshop today, I used the tool uh, as a refresher. Um, and it's actually, frankly, somewhat complicated. So another alternative uh, is going to be the tool we're going to introduce at the end of the workshop, uh, which again is the tool by Savvy. It's borrowers.buysavvy.com. And they've got a simple platform that can help you understand uh, what kind of affordable payments are available to you. Uh, so next slide, please. So enrolling in IDR plans, um, it frankly should be easy, but there are a lot of cracks that student loan borrowers can fall through. Um, and that's again why we've created this tool that should help people enroll automatically. So when a borrower uh, either visits their student loan servicer, the Department of Education, or uses a tool like Savvy, uh, they will either digitally or via the mail submit their application. Now that should take about 30 days to process. Sometimes it's faster. Um, after about a month, you should get confirmation that you are now enrolled in one of the income driven repayment plans. Now what's super important for people to remember is that a borrower has to recertify their income each year. So put it on your calendar 11 months after. So you got a little bit of wiggle room that you need to recertify. And the reason that is, is because if a borrower fails to recertify on time, uh, they will be put back in their 10 year standard repayment plan. So their monthly payments will go up again. Uh, and any interest that possibly accrued during that time will be capitalized and will added to your principal balance. So I hate to say it, I'm an advocate for student loan borrowers. I have missed my, my recertification before. And it meant that my loan balance went up and my monthly payment went up. Uh, until I could recertify again. So we don't want you to miss this at all. Um, so that's the program. Uh, it should be simple. Borrowers, again, fall through the cracks, unfortunately, often. 
Um, and so we encourage you to follow up with your loan servicer, really be diligent about the paperwork. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what we call um, the application abyss. Uh, now, applications should not take more than 30 to 60 days, give or take. You know, during the COVID crisis, there were some customer service issues at the Department of Ed. Uh, but if it's taking months, you've got a problem. You need to contact your loan servicer and contact the Department of Education to find out what's going on. Uh, borrowers often complain that their applications are sitting under review for months. Uh, they, they're rejected for minor paperwork issues. Uh, the Department of Ed and loan servicers have poor communication. They're not updating borrowers about the situation. Um, all of these are reasons why you could miss your recertification, but it can be costly. And so this is why we constantly stress that borrowers uh, stay on top of their application process and don't fall into the application abyss. The next slide here. So this is your checklist for repayment plans. Again, you can visit studentaid.gov for any of your federal student loan information or any information about the repayment plans. You can contact your loan servicer uh, or the Department of Ed to access the application. Um, you know, there's a paper version for those who are less tech friendly. You can also do it online, which uses some simple tools. Uh, you can also submit your application. Uh, and then lastly, you can reapply next year. You must reapply next year if you want to enroll. All of these are issues that borrowers could face. Um, and uh, we encourage borrowers, again, if the Department of Ed or your servicer are failing to do the job properly, uh, you may want to use our tool here that we've developed with uh, the folks at Sally, uh, Savvy. That's borrowers.buysavvy.com. So before we go into the next uh, section, and I'll pass it to Lindsay in a moment, I think it's probably a decent time to stop and do some Q&A. I see a lot of folks are asking questions uh, in the box here. Um, so let's get started with it. Uh, you know, Lindsay, there's a great question here about some of the updates related to CARES Act. Um, I think it's worth clarifying. This borrower asked, if you have an FFEL loan, one of those federal family education loans, or a Perkins loan, are you automatically excluded from CARES Act or are there some loans that qualify? That's a great question, Cody. Um, and so if you have a FELL loan, uh, it really depends because you can have a FELL loan that is potentially uh, owned by the Department of Education or you can have a FELL loan that is commercially held. Only those that are commercially held um, are going to not be eligible for the CARES Act benefit. Uh, I will tell you from personal experience, I have two fell loans from the same university, in fact, the same semester. One just so happens to be federally held, one happens to be commercially held. This was nothing you could have done differently. It's not your fault. Um, I would say for any of those with, with loans that are not eligible for the CARES Act, if you have not done so already, I would highly encourage you to reach out to your lender, servicer, whatever that may be, uh, to inquire about your relief options. A lot of them are extending forbearance periods that might normally or might you might not normally be eligible for during this time uh, because of the circumstances so and we at Savvy are help, happy to help you to do that um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later on about uh, how you can interact with us and get our support um, but that would be my recommendation for those with cell cell loans and, and Perkins loans if they're owned by the universities are also not going to be eligible uh, for the CARES Act but with cell it really can depend uh, upon that loan back to you Cody Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you know, here's a great question, Natalia. I know you've been really stressing this. Uh, Jody was asking, uh, what about borrowers who are making much less now than they were prior to the pandemic? Uh, can they enroll in one of these programs immediately? Do they have to wait? How do these programs help when folks are facing a crisis? Yeah, thanks, Cody. I think that's a great question. So that's actually why we're bringing you these workshops right now, is that while many of you have paused payments at 0% interest under the executive actions, we know that many of you, unfortunately, your position may have changed, you may be working less hours, you may not have a job at all. And for those folks, 
especially those folks, that's where it's going to be really good to take a look at these repayment programs because that will lock in your payment for a year as opposed to having to start to repay on January 1st if you apply and get approved for those payments ahead of the January 1st deadline. Yeah, that's Cody, so can I just add one, why... one more thing? Oh, yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Okay. I was just gonna, I won't, wanted to emphasize just one more thing. I saw this a few times in the comments. You know, people saying their income is basically at $0 and they have, you know, their student loan payment is still going to you know, upwards of 280 or something like that. On an IDR plan, an income driven payment plan, if you are making $0, you are unemployed, you have no income, you are eligible to qualify for a $0 monthly payment. Um, and I know we've, we've talked about this, but I can't emphasize this enough how important it is to take advantage of that situation right now. Doesn't matter if you get a job in a month or two months, you've locked in that $0 payment for 12 months. Um, and that's so important. It's going to provide you that relief for the next 12 months, you know, past when payments start. Um, so I highly encourage everyone to make sure they're taking advantage of that. Just wanted to drive that point home. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Lindsay. I mean, that's partly why we've put this borrower outreach program together, why we've teamed up on this tool. Uh, you know, there's so many borrowers that are going to be facing a financial cliff uh, and, or are already facing it due to the pandemic. And there are options. That's the most important thing to know there is there are affordable repayment options. Yep. And just one, one last point on this that I think is important, too, is if you have been furloughed, if you are currently making that $0 payment, um, and even if you know you're going to be going back to work, you could still legally lock in a $0 payment for the next year while you're currently on furlough. So just something to keep in mind because you know, not everyone may be unemployed. You may also be furloughed right now. Great point, Natalia. Uh, I've got a, you know, a lot of folks that are um, asking about their current situation. Um, Natalia, this is probably another one for you because you covered some of the uh, federal updates. Um, but a lot of people are asking when they should expect their student loan, their federal student loan payments to resume again. Uh, and this is all really important since things are changing quickly. Uh, can you clarify for folks? Absolutely. So for the majority of federal loan borrowers, except for those 9 million loans, commercially held fell loans and or unconsolidated Perkins loans, for everyone else, uh, right now it is $0 payment, 0% interest. And your first payment, you will start to need to make payments starting January 1st or the month of January, whenever your payment lands. And that's, I guess, another reason to say for those of you that are thinking about income-driven repayment programs, if I were going to enroll in one, I would do it before the January 1st deadline because I'm a little anxious about these servicers that already don't do a good job right now, um, let alone when they have to start taking care of everyone's loan at the same time. So that's why we're going to continue to be holding these workshops and getting all of this information to you so you can make your choices and not have to get ca caught up in that mess that may happen in January. All right, let's see. I've got some other questions coming through the pipeline. Um, let's see here. You know, this is always super important. Uh, I've got a question from Julie who is asking about where Parent PLUS loans fit in all of this. Do parents uh, qualify for income-driven repayment plans if they are struggling uh, to afford their payments? Uh, Lindsay, maybe you can help clarify for any of the parents that are on the call right now. Sure. Um, and yeah, let me just say one thing about for all the parents out there, uh, you know, the fastest growing demographic of student loan borrowers is 50 plus. It's parents taking out loans for their kids. So raise your hand if you are a parent. I'm not a parent yet, but I, I feel you all and your pain. You tend to have these parent plus loans have higher interest rates across the board. Um, so here's the deal with parent plus loans. In order to qualify for an income driven repayment plan, the only one you're able to potentially qualify for is ICR income contingent, and that is only after you've consolidated. So you would need to consolidate that Parent PLUS loan into a direct consolidation loan, at which point it would become eligible for the income contingent repayment plan. And the reason why I think these borrowers are in a particularly tough situation is not only because the interest rates on Parent PLUS loans tend to be higher, but 
the cap of your income for ICR is 20%, whereas for the other IDR plans, it's generally around 10%. So it takes a higher cap, a higher chunk of that income on your monthly payment. I know it, it really stinks. Um, but again, just to reemphasize, you need to consolidate that, you know, and that's not for everyone necessarily. So I don't want to you know, advocate for consolidation or that you'd want to see about, you know, contact your service or work with us to, to see what that would look like. But in order to be eligible for an income driven plan, you would need to consolidate. And the only plan you'd be eligible for is the income contingent repayment plan. That, that's the type of IDR plan. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, you know, I think there's actually a great segue. I've got folks like Rebecca on the call right now who are asking about details when it comes to the reality of student loan forgiveness for federal student loans, which is real. Uh, so, you know, with that, Lindsay, why don't you take it away from here and kind of give us a, a primer on student loan forgiveness for federal student loans? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and before I do, you know, I've been, I've been following this chat and, you know, listen, I know at this point you've heard a lot of information. This can all seem overwhelming. I'm a student loan borrower myself. I have a little over $200,000 in student loan debt. It feels like I started with 100,000 and it's just increased because of interest over the years. So if I can make anyone else feel better about their own situation, um, that's my, my goal today. Um, but just take a deep breath. We're going to now go into the sort of forgive section. Um, we're gonna talk about the ins and outs of how to qualify for these programs, which I'll be honest, have been notoriously difficult. Um, to get forgiveness, um, but it is real, as Cody said. Um, for any teachers that are on the line, um, there is a teacher loan forgiveness program. We're not going to go through it in detail today, um, but ping us in the chat and we can ha we'd be happy to provide you with more information um, and provide you with more details on, on the ins and outs of that program. We're going to focus on, for right now, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, or PSLF, as you'll hear me refer to it um, uh, going through the presentation. So if we move on to the next slide, great. So one of the things about forgiveness that many people don't really sort of think about is that it has a lot to do with your repayment. You know, not only is there a certain type of repayment plan that's required in order to be eligible for programs like public service loan forgiveness, but in order to sort of make the most of your situation, um, you really want to try to optimize it, right, by minimizing your monthly payment to maximize that forgiveness. And this this is where programs like Income Driven Repayment Plan in combined with the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program equal maximum benefit, basically, right? So when we talk about forgiveness, there's always going to be the element of what's your repayment plan looking like. Uh, and at Savvy, we really try to help make sure that borrowers are minimizing that monthly payment on an income driven repayment plan so that they can take full advantage of these forgiveness programs. So if we move right along, what is Public Service Loan Forgiveness? So here's the, 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 the gist, essentially. Um, this program started in October 1 of 2007. So any payments or, or uh, work history from that point forward would be eligible. Uh, but essentially, you need to make 120 qualifying payments, and we're going to talk about what a qualifying payment is in a second, uh, towards your loan um, in order to have the remainder of that loan balance forgiven tax-free. Okay, so there's no big tax bomb waiting you, no tax you know, implications. Um, now, these payments do not need to be consecutive. They just need to be cumulative. I'm going to repeat that. They do not need to be consecutive, just cumulative. Okay, so you can take a break if you need to. If you're ever on a deferment or forbearance, you're not going to be accumulating credits during those months. That's okay. You don't lose those credits. They just, you know, will pause and they will resume when you, you know, resume your eligibility. Um, and the sort of the three more, most important things around eligibility are, you know, your, your employer, you're working for a qualifying employer, your loan type, having a direct loan, and your repayment plan, being on an income-driven repayment plan. Uh, standard plans can sometimes count as well, but really being on that income-driven repayment plan. Uh, so if we go on to the next screen, this is going to show you essentially the basics of how to qualify for PSLF. So as I mentioned, first and foremost, let's sort of we run like the diagnostic test here. Do you have a direct loan? Okay. Those who have who do not have a direct loan, say you have a cell loan, um, or if you have a parent plus loan, even though it might be direct, you would still need to consolidate. If you have a cell loan, you can qualify for this program after consolidation. Okay, so you would need to consolidate into a direct loan. So it's possible if you don't have a direct loan right now, you can get one basically or or convert your loan. 
um, as we discussed in sort of the consolidation section. So first and foremost, you need to have a direct loan. Does your employer qualify, okay? And are you in a, in a qualifying repayment plan, all right? Once you've established those three things, check, 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 okay? You're gonna wanna submit what's called the employment certification form. This essentially gets signed by you, the borrower, and gets signed off by your employer and any previous employers, okay, so current or any previous, uh, back, you know, until 2007, uh, that you are an employee at that institution and that institution is a qualifying institution, um, and then it gets submitted to your servicer. And they go back and they, they basically, you know, check and count, okay, well, were they making payments? Did they have the right type of loan, right repayment plan? And were they working for that institution? Great, they have X many credits. Um, and so after you've made 120 payments under all those conditions, that's when you would submit the final sort of application itself for PSLS, okay? Um, now this certification form is, it's highly recommended that you submit it every year or when you change employers. This way, there's no confusion or there, there's no surprises when you sort of reach that 120. Oftentimes borrowers will think that they have a lot more credits than maybe their servicers uh, are actually telling them. Uh, and that discrepancy causes a lot of headaches and why so many borrowers have been, you know, part of my friend, screwed over by this process. Uh, and so this is why I wanna make sure you, you submit that form year over year so that 12 credits, every 12 credits, you're inching closer and closer to that 120. If we go on to the next screen, Great, so let's re sort of get to reiterate what does qualify for PSLF as far as loan types. So as I mentioned, direct loans. These come in a couple of different forms. You've got your direct subsidized and unsubsidized, direct grad plus loans. You have direct parent plus loans. Now just to be clear here, these still need to be consolidated in order to be eligible. Um, so I just wanna make that clear. And then you've got your direct consolidation loan, okay? Um, one of the easiest ways I always say to tell if you have a direct loan on your service or statement or account is it literally has to say the word direct or it might say DL, which stands for direct loan. As far as employers go, all levels of government, so you've got tribal, state, local, federal, okay, all of that counts. Any 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, and then there are some other critical public service careers and areas um, that we can, uh, you know, you can reach out to us if you're unsure that also would qualify for PSLF as far as your employer goes. And then repayment plan, the third sort of, uh, sort of trifecta here, that's part of the trifecta. Uh, you must be on an income-driven repayment plan or a standard plan is potentially eligible to accumulate credits. However, you're gonna need to be on an income-driven repayment plan for the majority of the time. Why? Well, if you're on the standard plan, that loan is getting paid off after 10 years you're not gonna have anything left to forgive after 10 years, right? So this is why the income-driven repayment plans are the, the sort of qualifying repayment plan for PSLF. I just saw a question come in about what if you have two jobs, and I just wanted to answer this one while we're on the topic. If you work for two employers, and both employers are qualifying employers or institutions, they can potentially both count so long as you work a minimum of 30 hours or more a week, okay? So you just need to make, to, to combine, 30 plus hours, and both institutions need to be qualifying, and you can qualify and use those for PSLF. Okay, moving on to the next screen. What does not qualify for PSLF? So I started mentioning this before, cell loans or federal family education loans. In their current state, do not qualify. They can become eligible through consolidation, okay, but you would only start accumulating credits towards forgiveness after you had consolidated that loan. So we see this and it's heartbreaking. Uh, and it just happened to myself. I know we work with so many teachers, it happens all the time. Borrowers who don't realize they have a cell loan until five, maybe 10 years into their, their service or their career and are, are thinking about that whole time that they're gonna be eligible and find out because of this loan type technicality basically that none of those years of service and payment count. And so the, the really important point here I wanna drive home is that identifying your loan type as early as possible in your repayment process is critical. Because if we identify, if you're looking to set yourself up for forgiveness and we identify that it's a loan type that potentially is not eligible, we want, you wanna take that corrective action as early as possible. That way you're not sacrificing any years of work and service and attainment on those loans. Other loans that don't qualify for PSLF are Perkins loans. If your loan is in default, okay, if you got that loan rehabilitated and back into good standing, now then that loan could count, but if it's currently in default, it won't. And any private student loans, 
all right? As far as employers that don't qualify, because there's oftentimes confusion around this, if you're a government contractor, okay, that won't qualify. Any labor union employees, 501c4 nonprofits uh, and or political groups, and any type of religious instruction, okay? Last but not least, as far as repayment plans that do not qualify for PSLF, these include the extended and graduated plans, uh, as well as extended graduated, uh, and anytime you're in a deferment, forbearance, or default, okay? Um, now, I will say something right now about the CARES Act and what's going on. Technically, right now, what's this period of suspended payment that most of you are hopefully qualifying for is known as an administrative forbearance. When we say forbearance here, right, and it not qualifying for, for PSLF, you know, during those months that you're in a forbearance, the great thing about the CARES Act right now is that they've allowed these months under this, this government forbearance, basically, to count as credits for PSLF. So if you are eligible, you could and are accumulating credits towards PSLF during this time when you're making no payments. So just wanted everyone to be clear about that and feel free if you have any questions, happy to clarify uh, even further. Okay, so if we move on to the next screen. Great, just sort of a basic checklist uh, of, of things that are gonna be helpful to, to recap this. So first of all, you can visit studentaid.gov to always find out more information uh, about the PSLF program or teacher loan forgiveness as well. Um, you can verify your employer qualifies and keep this documentation uh, either through us here at Savvy, through the IRS website, um, you know, to see what kind of employer you might have. Um, and you can do, you know, also enroll in a qualifying repayment plan uh, through the student aid website as well. Um, we encourage you to sort of continue to work full time and complete those 120 uh, monthly payments if you're planning to, to go towards PSLF. Um, and again, uh, borrowers.buysavvy.com, which I'm gonna sort of take you through in a second here, uh, is also going to be able to be a huge resource to help you in this process. Uh, and I'll show, exactly, show you exactly how in a second. Okay, moving on. Now, the Department of Education has sort of acknowledged uh, that the, the rollout of PSLF was less than ideal, right? You know, in 2017, we saw massive rejection rates of this program, right? Because if it started in 2007, 2017 was sort of that first year that borrowers could start applying. Uh, and, you know, we, we heard, and I'm sure many of you might be familiar, less than 1% of people got accepted. Why? Well, many of them didn't know uh, that they had to have a certain loan type, right? Many of these borrowers had the older cell loans. They didn't know they had to have a certain type of repayment plan. Um, and a lot of them hadn't even made the 120 payment yet, all right? In it's sort of a, an effort to help address some of these errors along the way, a couple of years ago, Congress actually actually appropriated a fund of money um, called the, to sort of expand the PSLF program called Temporary Expanded PSLF, or TEPSLF. And essentially, this program was to help borrowers uh, who had basically had the following. They met all of the PSLF requirements, okay? So they'd made 120 payments. They had a direct loan, okay? Uh, they worked for a qualifying employer, but they just weren't on the right type of repayment plan. Okay, now if this is you or anyone you know, uh, I highly encourage you to reach out to us if you have any questions or, or, or are interested in applying for this and, and need guidance or, or go to the Department of Ed website uh, because it's a limited fund. So when that money runs out, it, it's out unless it gets renewed. But we are applying borrowers for this left and right. And we recently just had one borrower receive $75,000 in TEPSLF forgiveness. She was not eligible for PSLF, but is eligible for the TEPSLF program. Um, so the process is a little bit wonky. You first need to submit your PSLF application and be denied, which that can take months in and of itself. Um, and then you can request consideration by sending an email to that email address listed there. Um, so if anyone has questions or needs assistance with this process, you know, ping us in the chat or reach out to us. I'm gonna provide our contact information uh, and we can definitely help you to, to look into this program. Moving on to the next screen. Great, okay, so, well, not great. <laughs> Forgiveness, cancellation, and discharge. I guess that's not, cancellation, discharge. Uh, actually, all, all good things, probably. Um, so, you are eligible outside of the public service loan forgiveness program that we've talked about um, to potentially qualify for other types of forgiveness, cancellation, and discharge. These might include a total and permanent disability discharge, uh, death discharge, okay? Um, if your school closed, uh, that there are you know, options around there as far as discharge goes. 
um, defense to repayment. Again, if you have, uh, if you worked, went to a for-profit school um, that has now closed your degree is no good, there are options that borrowers have around there. Um, so I would highly recommend again, and I'm going to provide, um, uh, our savvy staff can provide our support email address in the chat here to reach out if you have any questions about this or uh, on the Department of Ed website, you can find out some more about the qualifications for some of these cancellations and discharge programs. They're a bit rarer, um, but they still exist for many borrowers to take advantage of. And moving on to the last screen here. Great, so just a bit about debt relief scams, uh, just sort of as a, a warning that I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of. And I'm sure you guys have all seen, you know, a lot of these uh, as student loan borrowers. You know, I know I've seen, I've seen them left and right going online. Um, you know, I want to make sure everyone's aware that these scams typically involve offering some type of loan consolidation or debt forgiveness in exchange for an upfront fee, right? Sort of that upfront fee, that's the big thing here. Um, and this oftentimes is uh, exorbitant, you know, hundreds of dollars that borrowers are paying to these companies that are uh, defrauding them, essentially, and not helping them out. Um, so just be aware of anything that includes the lines, immediate loan forgiveness, it's never immediate, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, and deadline approaching, you know, trying to, you know, create some sense of false urgency around having to take action, anything like that, you know, make sure you're on, on top guard. We've, I just saw in the news recently another student loan scam that hit thousands and thousands of people. Um, and so, again, upfront fees, anyone claiming to be the Department of Education um, or promises of loan forgiveness, you know, a lot of the attorney general's offices in your states across the country are going hard after these companies uh, and suing them. Uh, and trying to take them down, um, but you are sort of your own best advocate. So, you know, just be on the lookout, make sure you're aware of these. Okay, so if we move on to the next screen. <laughs> Deep breath here. <laughs> so hopefully at this point, we've sort of explained, you know, Cody and I myself have taken you through the landscape around repayment, uh, the CARES Act, and, and potentially public service loan forgiveness if, if you're interested and eligible. Um, now, I want to talk about a, a tool that we at Savvy have, have devised to help you as borrowers. Uh, I know it's an overwhelming process to navigate on your own. Uh, so a completely free tool to help assist you in all these areas. Uh, so if we go on to the next screen, you can either visit the bit.ly slash borrower resources uh, in order to access this or borrowers.bysavvy.com. Um, but essentially, this, this free tool is going to help you to see your options, potentially enroll in these programs digitally for free, uh, whether that's IDR or public service loan forgiveness, uh, and you'll have access to our, our support and our expertise as well. Um, so just a, a bit about Savvy a little bit more if you go on to the next screen. You know, I, I talked about this at the very beginning, but we are a social impact tech startup. Uh, a, a registered public benefit corporation. We take that really seriously. Uh, you know, I told you I was a borrower myself. We are borrowers, advocates, experts who sort of, sort of come together, uh, develop a technology platform to help borrowers navigate this system, uh, which we ourselves, you know, are sort of the test subjects, the first ones. We know exactly how you all feel. Um, we work with a, a bunch of partners across the country and a bunch of users. You know, the average user right now, I think, is able to save around $156 just by enrolling on an income-driven repayment plan. Um, and so, you know, that ends up being a huge lifetime savings. Um, but essentially, it's a pretty simple process and, and how the tool works. So if we go on to the next slide here, we essentially are the diagnostic test. You can almost think about it like a TurboTax for your student loans. You know, you're going to enter in some information about your tax filing status, your income, your employment, all of this is to help us identify the optimal repayment and forgiveness plan for you. Uh, and then you can select that plan. And then we help with all of the digital enrollment, submitting it on your behalf, uh, and then monitoring that application. You know, Cody talked about this application abyss, right? Uh, it happens all the time. Borrowers get rejected. They don't hear back or they hear back and it's an incorrect amount and they think that they have no recourse. Uh, we help with all of that. Um, and so, again, that's where we get on the phone with you and your servicer. You know, if that application is taking too long, we're the first to, to knock on the servicer's door. Uh, so when you talk to Navient, it's not just going to be you alone. You have us there in the background to help you out. Um, so this is sort of really the savvy advantage that, that we really like to, to make sure borrowers are aware of. Um, so if we move on to the next screen, just to, to reiterate what the savvy tool can do. So we've got an employer database search uh, of all of the school districts 
and schools out there could be eligible for teacher loan forgiveness, as well as all the employers that are eligible for public service loan forgiveness. So bam, right off the bat, let's check and see if you're eligible for PSLS. Uh, we have an automatic loan sync, okay? So many borrowers, I mean, I think I created my FSA ID using an AOL account back in 2008. I mean, I, who knows? I don't really remember, right? We use your servicer login credentials, okay? So your Navian or whatever, we use Plaid to sync your loans over. So if you have a Venmo account or if you've synced, you know, with any technology, financial technology app recently, it, it pr probably used Plaid, sort of a best-in-class syncing service. We're able to sync over all that data, to, you know, read-only to be able to identify, okay, this is where you are with your loans. If potentially you have that sell loan and you're not sure, we're going to be able to identify it for you um, and make sure and flag it and then make sure you're able to get on the right track from there. So if you're worried right now, I don't even know if I have the right loan type, where do I even begin? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Um, and then when you go through this tool, uh, you're gonna see a personalized repayment and potentially forgiveness plan if you're eligible, okay? Um, and then like I said, we help with all of that digital enrollment in the repayment and forgiveness plans. Uh, and last but not least, you know, actually we have a few of our savvy support team on the, the webinar right now in the support box. I know they've been interacting with a lot of you. They're so excited to talk to you all and help you all. Um, but you're able to receive support and, and expertise from our experts. Expertise from our experts, nice line. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, this is one of the most compelling aspects about Savvy and uh, why we do what we do. Um, and if I haven't mentioned this enough already, it is completely free for everyone on this call, all, you know, all the borrowers who have access to this. So it's borrowers.buysavvy.com. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, Great, so I've sort of skipped ahead of here already in what I've been saying, but this is just a quick look at that tool. You know, we start off by asking you two pretty simple questions, which is your expected income for 2020 and your current student loan payment. You know, if you're currently paying zero under the CARES Act benefit right now, um, don't put zero, put what your payment was beforehand, because that's gonna be a better indicator of what that payment might be when you resume in January. And then you click, let's get started and go through the tool. That's pretty much it. Um, and again, it's completely free, this entire thing, you know, accessing our experts, the digital enrollment, all of it, completely free through this program. Um, if we go on to the next slide, here's just a quick look at our loan sync. Great, so again, we use Plaid. You're able to sort of identify the loan servicer that you have, let's say it's Navient, simply enter in your username and password credentials and it's gonna sync over securely that data into our tool. Uh, if you have multiple servicers, you can uh, select those as well. Um, so you can sync multiple servicer loans. I saw a question come through about private loans. Yes, we can help you with your private loans as well. Um, so while the programs that we talked about here today, whether it's IDR or PSLS, are not eligible for, for private loans, um, it's still an important part of your student loan picture, right? You know, while most of the student debt out there is, is federal, people who have private loans tend to also have federal loans because you might have gotten private loans after you exhausted your federal options. So you can sync your private loans the same way. Um, you enter in whatever that commercial or third party lender might be, you know, Chase, Wells Fargo, Discover, enter in your username and password credentials, and it'll sync all that data over as well. And it'll flag for our support team that you have private loans and we'll be able to reach out and help uh, and devise some options for you. And last but not least, here's a look at the results page. So this is really, if we go on to the next screen, a look at um, what the sort of personalized repayment and forgiveness plan. I mean, it's down to the cent, and our algorithm is, is very, very good um, at what you potentially could qualify for, um, you know, how much that monthly savings would be, and any projected forgiveness that you might be eligible for, um, you know, under PSLF or potentially teacher loan forgiveness. Uh, and last but not least, a look at our, our borrower dashboard on the next slide here. So again, I'd mentioned this is where we help to monitor all those applications, right? These, this, a lot of these things are not going to happen overnight. It can be a cadence of touch points over, you know, a couple of days, months, you know, uh, years potentially, right? This is where we, we don't just submit them for you and say, see you later, good luck. We're with you through the whole process. Uh, and so this is where borrowers, when you create that free account, when you log back in, this is the first thing you see. Um, and this is where you're going to see where you are in that process. You can also contact an expert um, from here, uh, which brings me to our, our final page, our support team. I mean, they truly are the engine behind our, uh, you know, Savvy, what makes Savvy work. Uh, and we, they all have student loans themselves, so they all, uh, you know, enjoy getting on the phone and talking with you. Um, so here's our contact information for our support team. So you can either email us at partners at buysavvy.com, 
uh, or there's the number to call. Or if you're on the tool right now, if you're on borrowers.buysavvy.com, on the bottom right-hand corner of every screen in the tool is that green support button. Just click that and you can chat or send a message to our support team and they will be able to help you out. I would say that's probably the fastest way to get in touch uh, and we respond, we respond pretty quickly. So um, again, I, I highly encourage you um, to, to reach out and, and take advantage of our, our technology and our support and our services in whatever capacity you see fit. Um, you know, we're here first and foremost as advocates to help um, and uh, you know, look forward to being able to help you with your student loans. So hopefully that wasn't too fast for you all, uh, but appreciate you having me on, Cody and Natalia, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, you know, obviously it's a ton of information. We try to cast a relatively wide net here uh, during our workshops because there's so many uh, specific student loan situations. There's so many different programs. Uh, that is why we've put together this student loan borrower outreach program. Uh, so before we address questions, I just want to remind folks that if you need more information, if you want to watch a recording of the workshops, uh, if you want to access the tool, uh, by Savvy. You can visit our Student Borrower Outreach Program website. It's bit.ly slash borrower resources. And I'll make sure to put that in the um, chat box for everyone as well. Uh, so with that, let's try to address some questions. I see a lot of really great ones coming through. Um, let's see here. Okay, uh, this is a question from Elizabeth about public service loan forgiveness. I think we get this question all the time. Uh, a borrower wants to know if you haven't submitted any public service loan forgiveness paperwork to date, can you start to use employment prior to today's date for your qualifying payments? So as we mentioned, public service loan forgiveness requires 10 years of qualifying work uh, to qualify. Uh, so can a borrower retroactively use the last five, six, seven, eight years of work to uh, make progress toward the program? Uh, Lindsay, maybe you want to discuss that? Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. This program is retroactive. So, you know, if you're just finding out about this now um, and you have previous employment, as long as, you know, you think you, ha you had direct loans during that time, you worked for a qualifying employer, right, and you were on the right repayment plan, uh, we can go back in time to, to help you to certify that employment. Um, so, you know, you can find that employment certification form through the Department of Ed, um, or you can enlist Savvy's help to do that for you as well. We do that all digitally. So, you know, we send it off to your HR for signature uh, to acquire that and submit it on your behalf. Um, so the answer is absolutely yes. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is a great question for Meredith, and I think it's something I can address because I know I've been working on this uh, diligently since the pandemic started. Uh, but Meredith was asking um, if a borrower has their federal student loan payments suspended until uh, December 31st, um, what happens to your income-driven recertification deadline? So for those of you who had to recertify your income for an income-driven repayment plan during the suspended payments uh, that will go until December 31st, uh, your recertification deadline will be pushed back according to Department of Education guidelines. Uh, we are encouraging borrowers to not only wait to hear from their student loan servicer, but to proactively reach out to your loan servicer to get more information about this. Uh, but it's worth mentioning, and that's why we are talking about these programs today, uh, that you can manually and proactively enroll in an income-driven repayment plan and recertify your income at any time. So if a borrower during this pandemic experiences a decrease in income or hasn't enrolled already, they can do so now. Uh, and you may have suspended payments until December 31st, but at least you've locked in lower payments until this time next year. So we are encouraging borrowers if they see that their situation in the near future, excuse me, in the over the next year may not improve greatly, that you may want to lock in that lower payment now. And again, you can enroll at the Department of Ed's website or uh, you can lose, use uh, Lindsay's tool at Savvy at borrowers.buysavvy.com. 
Hey, uh, Cody, if I can add just one, one more thing there too, please. you know, yep. if you are in a bad financial situation, I hope more, you know, more than anything that your situation does improve. But if you wait until it does improve to do something about your student loans, you won't be able to take advantage of that, that zero, potentially that zero dollar payment or that lower payment, right? So this is about sort of taking advantage of your situation now for however, you know, worse it might, or, you know, much worse it got, or, you know, might be to lock that in and hopefully it gets better, but that, and that's okay. Even if you do get that job the next month or, or what have you, uh, but doing it right now so that you can lock it in and, and help yourself out given what's going on. Uh, and then hopefully things turn up and then that'll be okay, but at least you've locked it in for that period of time. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, another question on income-driven repayment plans. They're super dense, so I want to clarify this. Uh, this is for uh, Lisa. Alisa uh, was asking, for something like repay, revise pays your own program, why is it 20 or 25 years for the payment timeline? Uh, and so I can tell you, Lisa, that's because the newest program, repay, uh, has a unique feature about it that says, if you are repaying a federal loan for undergraduate studies only, so an undergraduate loan, then your repayment schedule is 20 years. If you have any loan that's used for graduate studies, a graduate plus loan, then your repayment schedule is 25 years. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we've seen over the years that graduate students, those are the most ambitious and most successful and most, uh, driven students that we have in our society are often those that are um, used to fund a lot of these programs, meaning that they pay the most uh, and it's really unfair. So uh, if you have a graduate student loan and you want an income driven repayment plan, you may wanna choose one of the other programs which doesn't have, uh, which doesn't have this specific mechanism that's confusing. All right, let's see here. Okay, we've got a great question. Um, you know, Lindsay, this is probably something you've seen come up during uh, your work with borrowers at Savvy. Uh, a person wanted to know, can a borrower apply for an income-driven repayment plan uh, if they receive income as an independent contractor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any any type of income, whatever it may be, however you may receive that, um, you know, the when you apply for an income driven repayment plan, part of the application requires that you submit supporting documentation attesting to your income, and that can come in two forms: either your most recent tax return, um, so that would be the 1040 form, okay, not your W two. A lot of people attach to W two, and that that doesn't that'll get rejected. That's not an eligible form. So your your 1040 form or um, your most recent pay stub or pay stub from the past 90 days. Um, and so either of those that would attest to that income. So for an independent contractor, you know, most likely it'd probably be, if you're not receiving maybe a pay stub like that or, or you know, like an, an, under normal circumstances, it might be your, your tax return. Um, but regardless, that's going to attest to your income um, and you are able to submit that application and get onto an IDR, you know, whatever that, that income may be. All right, uh, you know what, I think with that, because we ran a little bit over, we can wrap up our workshop today. I know there's still a ton of questions. So at the end of this workshop, uh, you will receive a follow-up email that sends you a link to our, um, to the uh, Borrower Resource Center. Um, in fact, Dylan, if you could go to the next slide, I'll remind folks that that's bit.ly slash borrower resources. We will shortly have uh, a recording of the workshop up there. There's also the Savvy tool. There's some one-page handouts for you to read about these topics. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, Dylan, I also want to ask folks, when you receive the follow-up email, if you could take our borrower feedback survey that's included there, that would be extremely helpful. We are testing this content. We're improving it, and we're going to hopefully provide best practices for nonprofits all over the country uh, to help borrowers understand their options. Um, so that will come to an email. You can always reach out to us, respond to that email as well. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible.
So with that, thank you, Lindsay and Dylan for joining us. And thank you for all of the attendees. We had a packed house, very exciting. We appreciate you so much. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.